guys ready for the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me pray for you. Every, everybody, welcome Peru and all those watching online. Give them a big, big clap. Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All those TV, radio, all that good stuff. All right, let me pray. Father, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. Pray that you bless them, touch them, minister to them. Father, I pray that use something I'm about to say to change us all for eternity, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody says Amen, amen. Well, hey, I'm so glad to be back. Michelle and I had a little sabbatical week in Florida. We defrosted. <laughs> Praise God. 80 degrees. We ate God's chicken at a Chick-fil-A <laughs> with no mask, no nothing. It was like heaven. Almost, praise God. So it was a great, great time. I do want to first and foremost, though, thank Josh for standing in for me last week. He did a great job. Give him a big clap. <laughs> praise God. Pastor Tove took care of Peru. Pastor Caleb ran and did everything here, praying for the kids and all that. And, and honestly, truthfully, I just want everybody to know, man, you are sitting in one of the greatest bunch of servant leaders on the planet. Our church leadership, man, I'm not saying that because I'm the guy in charge. Actually, I'm not the smartest guy in the room most of the time, all right? But they are absolutely awesome, and we can't do this without them, so we just so appreciate it. It's good for Michelle and I to get away, amen? <laughs> Praise God. So, uh, so in light of that, I do want to correct one thing that Josh said last week, and I do apologize for him getting this wrong. I can see my fingerprints, and I don't need glasses, regardless of what he says. I just don't see any more punctuation when I read things. It's a joke. Some of you will get it later. It's too small. But that doesn't mean I need glasses. I'm in denial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the first point to recovery. All right, anyway, here we go. So I got a, got a series we're going to start this week. We're going to call it From Zeros to Heroes. All right, zeros and heroes. I did not think it would be wise as a pastor to start out on Mother's Day talking about zeros. <laughs> I mean, you know, I may look dumb, but I'm not. But the reality is we're going to talk about a hero. So each week we're going to bring to you a Bible character, and we're going to talk about whether they're a zero or a hero. All right, we're going we're gonna to kind of compete for it. So we got zeros and we got heroes. We got people that really were called to do something greater than what they ended up doing. And then we got other people who, honestly, they exceeded the expectations of what you would think uh, in their life. So in light of that, starting out with a hero this week, we're going to start about, uh, talking about a young lady. Obviously, it's Mother's Day, but she, was, she actually isn't a mother as far as we know. I mean, she may have had kids later on, but in the Bible story, she, she isn't a mother. There actually is a uh, Jewish feast that actually pertains to her uh, because of what she did, and it's called Purim, um, and that feast is a celebration of the Jews being saved from an evil guy named Haman. Anybody know the lady that we're going to talk about today? Esther. Everybody say Esther. Esther, all right? So Esther is a phenomenal, phenomenal story in the Bible. There's about 10 chapters. It's in the Old Testament. It's a part of the Jewish uh, uh, Old Testament. It's a Christian Old Testament. Uh, it is interesting whenever you get into the book of Esther from a theological standpoint, you will find that not everybody believes that the book of Esther should be in the Bible, um, which is interesting. People like Martin Luther came along, and he, uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, he came along and he said that he did not believe that the book of Esther belonged in the Bible, he, but he believed that about other books too, like the book of James, the book of Revelation. Um, he believed that, but the truth of the matter is, I believe with all my heart, it is in the Bible and it belongs there, because it is a phenomenal story. Let me tell you why most people have a problem with it though. The reason that theologians have a problem with it is because it doesn't teach any, quote, deep theological uh, principles. It, what it does is it shows how God moves in someone's life. But it doesn't teach like, it's not deep teaching on prayer. It's not deep teaching on this or that or the other. But it does speak specifically of how God encounters people and people encounter God in their day-to-day -day walk with him. Can I get a witness on that? So here's what we're going to do. Looking at it, I love what uh, Matthew Henry said this. He's a great Bible commentary. He says this, and I love this. God's name is not in the book, but his hand is certainly all over it. Okay? That's Charlie Riley paraphrased of that. But, but the reality is, 
you don't see the name of God in the book of Esther. Matter of fact, you don't really find anything super deep like that. You just don't. But that doesn't mean God isn't moving throughout it. Matter of fact, I believe that the book of Esther should show us and enlighten us on how God moves in our lives even when we don't see him moving. See, it's one thing for you to see God moving in your life. It's another for you to not see it but recognize it is happening. We have a word for that. We have a title for that, a name for that as preachers. We call it divine providence. What does that mean? God is moving supernaturally, naturally, all right? God is moving in our lives supernaturally, but naturally. We see him moving in the natural circumstances of our life. And you look at the Old Testament, and there are all kinds of Bible figures that this happened with. Think about Joseph. Joseph was a man... The only thing he did wrong was tell his, his brothers and his dad his dream. That ended him, he ended up in slavery, he ended up in jail, he ended up in prison. He literally was innocent, and he didn't do anything wrong. And yet, he ended up in a mess, not because of anything he did, but God was ordering the steps the whole time. And he didn't realize it. You look at Moses. Moses made some mistakes, but the reality is God set that whole thing up and God moved it over a period of time. We call that divine providence. It's where God is moving behind the scenes even though he doesn't seem like he's the main actor of the story. He's actually the main actor pulling all the strings behind the story. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? So in light of that, there are all kinds of Bible verses that allude to it. And it actually talks about it in Romans about you and I, our life. Here's what it says about that. This would be divine providence. And we know that all things work together. Now, now, that doesn't mean all things feel good. That doesn't mean you make every right decision. But as a believer, we believe if we serve God, we know that all things are working together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose and plan. So we know all things are working together, not for our bad, but for our good. Whether we feel like it or not, whether we see it or not, all things are working together for your good. I've said this for years and I believe it to be true. Your stupidity has already been figured into the equation. <laughs> Can I get a witness on that? Your stupidity has already been a part of the program. God knows. God knows. I mean, who knew? Take for me, me for an example. You know, who knew that if you fall out of a tree 30 feet in, in, onto the ground and you end up really hurting yourself that the DNR would call you and ask you to talk about safety at a meeting. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew that they would ask you a preacher preaching at a DNR meeting about safety who fell out of a tree and you want to hear the blessing? They gave me a turkey call for it. <laughs> I'm super excited about it. All things are working together for my good. Now that's a $100,000 turkey call. All right? That's how much my hospital bills were. But, but, but the reality is all things are working together for my good. And you've got to have that mentality. That's, that's called the divine providence of God. That means, that means even when I don't feel it, God's moving in my favor. Even when it doesn't look good, God's moving in my favor. Even when it doesn't feel good, God's moving in my favor. I know God is moving in my life. Can I get a witness on that? Praise God. God is moving. Praise God. He is alive and well. So in light of that, whenever we look at the book of Esther, we find out that God was moving all through her life, um, specifically the portion of scripture that is called the book of Esther. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that you understand, number one, the key players. Second of all, I want to make sure that you understand the story, because I don't want to assume that everyone has read the book of Esther. I will tell you that you should read it, and I would strongly encourage you to read it this week. It's 10 chapters pretty easy reading, and it's a phenomenal story, and actually everything that I'm going to teach you today about it, um, you will see in the scripture as you read it. But just for time's sake, we're not going to read it. I'm just going to give you key players and the key of the, in the main uh, part of the story, kind of at about a 2,000 mile an hour speed. I'm just going to rattle this thing off, all right? So here are the people that really play a major role in the story. You have King Xerxes. He's the king over Persia at this point in time. You have Queen Vashi. She is the queen at the time of the beginning of the book. Then you have Haman. Haman is actually, who is actually the second in charge to King Xerxes at, was one, at one point in time. And then I'll explain that here in a little bit. But he is the bad guy, Haman, 
all right? Um, he is an agite. Any of the ites in the Bible are bad. <laughs> if it's ite, anybody, the Amorites, the Moabites, the anybites, they're bad, all right? Mordecai, Mordecai, who is the cousin of Esther, and he actually, he is the cousin of Esther, and he is actually the one who raises Esther. Esther is actually an orphan, all right? Her father, uh, she has no mother or father, uh, as far as we don't know where they went. She, uh, but, but Mordecai ends up being her dad, her, her spiritual father, and he raises her. Um, her actual Hebrew name was Hadassah. Her Esther, the word Esther, just for point of reference, it means star. And she literally is the star of the book of Esther. Uh, it's kind of interesting because Michelle and I, last night, whenever we went out to eat after services, we were talking and she goes, you know what? As you were preaching it, I realized that the book of Esther is actually the first Hallmark movie. <laughs> That's what you think of? Whenever you hear the book of Esther, and, and honestly, her, her, one of her favorite movies, this was made maybe 15, 20 years ago, I don't know how long, but there's a movie called A Night with the King. How many of y'all seen that or heard of it? And Michelle loves it, she watches it. Anytime there's nothing on, she'll watch it, and, and it's like a Hallmark movie. Whatever. All right, anyway, so let, let's go through the story real quick and kind of give you a, a, a quick view of the story. So you have at the v very beginning of the book, you find that King Xerxes, he is the king of Persia. He is the king in charge of everything. And I want you to understand that back in those days, the king ruled, and, and that was the way it was, all right? The king was almost unquestionable as far as his authority and what he could do. So the king decides he's going to throw a party. Him and all his buddies, they get together. The game's on. They're watching the game, hanging out. That's a joke. Uh, they're hanging out, and they start drinking. How many of you know it's never good when people start drinking, Michelle? All right, it's never good. All right, so, so they start drinking, and next thing you know, he decides he's going to call for Queen Vashi to come. Well, Queen Vashi isn't in the mood that day for whatever reason, and she doesn't come. Well, that automatically creates a stir, all right? She's not, she's not coming to the king's request, so it causes a stir. So what happened, go and read it. It's an amazing thing, that Bible. What happens is the dudes that are around the king go, hey, man, what's wrong with you? He's like, what? He goes, you got to do something about her. We're all married, too. And if your wife disobeys the king, we're all going to be in trouble. I am not exaggerating. That's the story. And so they're all like, dude, you got to do something about her. So he gives her the boot. He boots her out. Peace, see you later. Kicks her out. Well, the next day he wakes up from his drunk stupor and goes, oops. And the guys are like, dude, we got this covered. We got it all good. We got it all taken care of. The king goes, okay, what are we going to do now? The queen's gone. They go, hey, listen, we're going to gather all the virgins from the kingdom, and we're going to bring them here, and you're going to pick the one that you like the most. For some odd reason, he agreed to that plan. It was a joke, too. <laughs> but anyway, so they bring all these women there, young ladies, and the king is going to pick his queen. Now, according to the Bible, it was a 12-month process in which they went through to get the queen, all right? And the deal was, if the king summoned you and you left, but you never came back, then you were out, okay? So this is like a year-long bachelorette, <laughs> or bachelor, which is it? Whatever. All right, anyway, so, so the, I don't watch them shows. Can you tell? <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so they, they came in. Anyway, Queen... Uh, queen uh, 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 Esther, she, I can't remember the name of the book. Uh, she came in and the king was pleased by her according to the Bible and she left and then he called her back. So she ends up becoming the queen. Now, if the movie stopped there, it wouldn't be a Hallmark movie. It would be like Happily Ever After. That's like a Disney movie. Okay? That isn't the way it goes. So what happens is, She's now the queen. Next thing you know, there's an evil person that comes along, and the, there are two guys that want to assassinate the king. All that happens is Mordecai hears about it because he's hanging out at the courts. He, he hears about this, this 
uh, attempted uh, taking out of the king, and he tells Queen Esther, then it is recorded. Long story short of it is, somehow it works its way to Haman. Haman actually gets promoted for revealing the plan of killing the king. So Haman gets promoted. So then the king makes a rule that everybody's got to worship Haman. Everybody's got to bow down to Haman. Everybody's got to give, the Bible calls it homage, homage to Haman. Well, Mordecai isn't bowing for nobody. He's a Jew, he only worships God, and he's not about to show uh, Mordecai, or I'm sorry, Haman, any favor. So what happens is Haman gets upset, and he decides not just to try and go after Mordecai. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eliminate the Jews completely. I'm going to wipe them out. So what does he do? He goes to the king, and he says, king. There are these group of people that don't worship the king and they don't obey the king. So we're going to make a law and we want you to sign it that allows us in 12 months from now to wipe them all out. So the king didn't read the bill, but he signed it. Just so you, you get the reference later. So he signs the bill, signs the law, and next thing you know it goes out throughout the land that the Jews are going to be wiped out in a year, all right? Mordecai is upset because here's the deal. Haman had a beef with him, and now he's trying to wipe out the entire group of Jews that are there. So Mordecai goes to Esther and goes, hey, listen, you got to go before the king. And she gets upset, and she goes, no, listen, he hasn't called for me for 30 days. I don't know if he's upset at me. I don't know if him and his buddies are hanging out. I don't know if the game's on. I don't know. He hadn't called for me. I don't know what to do. He goes, doesn't matter. You got to go and talk to him. And Mordecai kind of lays it on her and goes, hey, listen, if you think you're going to sit up in that palace and be protected from everything that's going on down here, you got a sad thing coming. You're a Jew just like we are. And if, if, if it goes down, you're going to be taken out also. So then she has to pray about this thing. So she sets up this, this lunch date with the king. So King Xerxes comes in and he brings Haman with him. Haman and King Xerxes are there and she wines and dines him and talks to him. And the king is like, hey, listen, what do you want? Why did we do this? What do you want? I'll give you up to half the kingdom. What do you want? And he, she goes, hey, can we do this in a couple days and I'll come back? So the king says, okay. Bottom line is, a few days roll around. She comes back. They have this meal. As they're having this meal, she begins to tell the king, hey, listen, check this out. Here's the scoop. The Jewish people are going to be annihilated. I am a Jew, and I'm going to be killed. The queen is going to die if this law is put into place. And he goes, what? The king is upset because now he realizes someone was trying to take out the queen and the Jewish people. He's upset. So the Bible says he walks away. As he walks away, Haman falls over the couch and falls towards the queen, Esther, all right? Well, the king comes around the corner at that point in time and thinks that Haman is trying to attack Queen Esther, all right? How many of you know that ain't going to go well? The king's already out for it. Now he's upset. Now you're going to attack the queen. How many of you know, my kids learned a long time ago, you don't insult the queen, all right? So next thing you know, next thing you know, he grabs Haman up and he tells the guards to take him out, and Haman was hung on the gallows that he made in his backyard that, were that he was going to hang Mordecai on. So that's how the story goes. Now, there's a couple key points that I want to make sure you understand. Number one, when Esther first went to the king, she went, she hadn't seen the king in 30 days, and she went in, and the Bible says that he extended his sepulcher to her. Had he not, she would have been beheaded. And there would have been nothing said, okay? She went and risked her life to try and save the Jewish people. And that's when, that's what set up the two lunch dates, all right? So that's kind of the story at, at, at 50 mile an hour through the book, 10 chapters, right there's the story. Now, what I think is so profound, though, is that there's one portion of Scripture that everybody knows from the book of Esther, all right, and I'm going to read it. If you aren't familiar with it, you'll recognize it as soon as I get there. It says this. This is Mordecai talking to Esther. And it says, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come and arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. In other words, don't think you're going to sit up in that house and be protected from this destruction that's coming. He says, Yeah, 
Who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And most people have understood that. Most people know it. And the powerful portion of that verse is this. That according to the Bible, Esther was brought into the place that she was at for that one particular moment in time to do what God had called her to do. In other words, her whole life culminates in this idea for such a time as this. That's really what it boils down to. Now, here's the reality. What does that mean to you and I? What it means for you and I is that I believe that each and every one of us should live with the mentality for such a time as this. That really is the purpose of the story, to teach you and I that you could have been born at any point in time in world history. You could have been born anywhere. You could have been born at any point to any parents, but God has chosen you for right here, right now, for such a time as this. Let me kind of flip that and kind of play it out my way. I believe with all my heart, I was born to my mom and my dad. I was moved to Indiana. I, I was raised in Kokomo. I grew up here. I went into the military. All this was being orchestrated by God. I didn't have any plans on being a preacher. I would have been the last guy that you would have saw and thought, that's a preacher. I promise you. This was not in my cards. This was not in the plan. But it was in the mind of God. And God was moving and orchestrating each and every one of the steps, bringing the right people at the right time with the right heart to speak to me in the right manner so that I could be brought to a place in time where I could begin to walk in the fulfillment and the plan that God has for me. I believe with all my heart I was born for such a time as this. I believe with all my heart you were born for such a time as this, praise God. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? I believe that with all my heart you were born now, praise God. All right? God has a plan for your life now. Now here's the deal though. When you look at Esther, she was born for such a time as this. You and I are born for such a time as this. But what allowed her to go from a zero to a hero? What allowed her to move in a place to where she ended up saving an entire nation? What allowed her? So I'm going to give you five key points that I believe you can draw from the story. And again, I'm not going to give you every chapter and verse for these stories, but I do believe, or for, for these uh, principles, but I do believe that each and every one of these are absolutely profound and each one will change your life in and of itself, much less all five together. So let's talk about the first thing that I believe that you can draw from the story of the book of the Esther. Number one, preparation always comes before promotion. That's the one thing you got to know, young people. Listen, nothing comes easy. It all starts with preparation. And we live in a society and a culture that they don't want to do any of the work, but they want all the fruits of it. But, but that isn't the way real life works. If you want to do anything, you have to prepare yourself for it. You have to prepare yourself. You have to work hard and prepare yourself for it. Anything that you're doing, you're preparing yourself for something. I believe right now, I, I believe Bible college was about preparing myself for a church. I believe that growing the church has been a process, and it's a preparation for the next level. I believe that you never grow out of your preparation for your next level. You are always in preparation mode. You never arrive. You're always moving from glory to glory. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter and brighter. I'm here to tell you, we are all in preparation. And the key to moving from one level of God to the next level of God is being satisfied with the state of preparation that you are in. It is key and most important that you understand that preparation is a part of promotion. You don't get promoted if you don't prepare yourself. But if you will prepare yourself, you will always be promoted by God. Whenever you look at the book of Esther, it is absolutely awesome what she had to go through to be prepared. Here's the deal. She was going to go and spend one night with the king. But I want you to look at this. And some of you ladies, you're going to love this. Some of you men are going to be like, that explains a lot. <laughs> Here it is. Esther chapter 2 verse 12. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes after she had completed 12 months of preparation, 12 months of preparation. Y'all ain't picking it up the way I'm getting it. According to the regulation 
for the women. The dudes didn't set the preparation time. This is women prep time. For thus were the days of their preparation appointed. So what did they have to do? They're preparing themselves. What do they do? What do they have to suffer for God in such a deep manner? Six months with oil of myrrh. Six months? In six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Six months of oil treatments in spa days in rock treatments in oils in perfumes. Six months a year. 12 months total, and I complain about 20 minutes? <laughs> what is wrong? <laughs> what is the malfunction? Let me just give you some of you young men some marriage counseling. <laughs> Do not complain. Do not complain. It took her 12 months to get ready. <laughs> 12 months. And then if you're, first of all, if you've been married for a while, you know this, that the best thing you could say is nothing <laughs> about a woman getting ready, all right? That's the best thing you could do. Some of you young men who haven't been married long enough, or maybe you're debating about dating, let me give you a revelation. You start talking, they start downshifting. <laughs> Where do you think granny gear came from, all right? I came from a downshift, praise God. It's like, can't we get out the door? Can't we get going? Oh, just call me Esther. I think I'll take my time. <laughs> All right? 12 months of preparation for this chick to get out the door. <laughs> you may not find funny things in the Bible, but I find funny things all the time. All right? And it's amazing to me. She prepared herself. Now, I say that with all, with all, with joking, but on a serious note, do you know that every great woman or man in the Bible always has a season of preparation? Every one of them. There's not a one that went literally from here to there without God preparing them. Moses took 40 years in Pharaoh's house, 40 years on the backside of the desert, to reign and rule the children of Israel for 40 years. It took him twice as long in preparation as it did for him to rule over the children of Israel. Think about Joseph. It took him 17 years of silence, basically, of him being obscure and nobody knowing him, except as a prisoner for him to become next in charge to Pharaoh. Everything that God does in every man or woman of God is about preparing them. And the key is to pass the preparation, is not to bail on the preparation. One of the reasons that most people don't see God do big things in their lives is they bail on God during the preparation phase. I know whenever my son was young, you know, whenever Michael became 12, 13 years old and I started introducing him to men, I, I trained him on how to interact with men. I trained him. I taught him this. I told Michael, I said, listen, if we're sitting at a table and a man walks over to the table, you don't sit there, you stand up, because that's what men do. You stand up, and you don't limp it over, you stand up, and you stick your hand out, and you give a handshake, and it's not, that's not a handshake, that's sissy, all right? You, you, you. It's a firm handshake. It's solid. It's, it's not wimpy, and it isn't Armstrong in somebody. You, and you call, yes, sir, no, sir. You look them in the eye. That's what men do. It's preparing him for what? To be a man. Come on, somebody talk to me in here. Amen? That's what you do. You prepare, and the problem is, a lot of times, people stop preparing people, and what happens is they wonder why people's lives aren't moving forward. You've got to prepare yourself. Preparation is the key. Here's the way I look at it. It may seem minuscule, but it is absolutely not meaningless. In the military, they teach you how to fold your t-shirts. Seriously. They teach you how to make your bed. They teach you how to shine your shoes. 
They teach you how to put your clothes on. You say, everybody knows how to do those things. Oh, no, 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 no. They want to make sure that you understand that the details matter to them. And they're preparing you. And if you, if you bail in basic, you're not going to touch their equipment. Because if they tell you that these things matter, then they expect you to understand the t-shirt had nothing to do with it. The t-shirt was preparation for you to handle something bigger. The boots had nothing to do with it. They could care less about your bed. It was preparation for something bigger than your bed. Amen? It's all about preparing you. Matter of fact, here's the way I look at it. Pre preparation time is never wasted time. I know we think of that. We're like, oh my God, when, Lord, are you going to do something? Ho, 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 ho. Wait, 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 wait. Let the preparation time. Let it do its job. How many of you grew up at, with this show? The, the original one. Wax on? <laughs> Wax off. Come on, somebody. Huh? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Wax on, wax off. Paint the fence, up, down, up, down. Very good, Daniel son, very good. <laughs> yeah? I mean, you remember the first time you were watching it? It's like, what is this kid, the janitor? I mean, what's he doing? He's doing all the homeboys' yard work. No, 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 no. He was being prepared by Mr. Miyagi. Yeah, he was preparing himself for something bigger. See, had Daniel's son walked out, he would have never become hmm, Daniel's son. <laughs> he would have never stood on the bow of the boat. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you see what I'm saying, though? Some of you are like, I don't know what we're talking about. You need to live a little. Watch Karate Kid, and not the new one. It's terrible. Watch the first one, praise God. All right? But the reality is this. God is preparing you. If you bail on preparation, you disqualify yourself. The enemy wants to frustrate you during preparation, always. Here's the second principle I think you can get from Esther's life. Spiritual warfare is proof of spiritual purpose. Spiritual warfare is always proof of spiritual purpose. If everything's coming easy, be careful. Understanding this in the story, Haman was being manipulated by the enemy, Satan, to destroy the children of Israel. Esther didn't know it was the devil. She didn't know what was going on. She just knew that there was opposition to what she was trying to do, and she didn't see any reason why anybody would want to kill the Jews. But the reality is there is an unseen spiritual war going on all around us, and if we are ignorant to it, we're going to fall, actually pray to it. But the reality is we need to recognize that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and evil rulers of the darkness of this world. There are people that hate Christians just because they're demonically possessed and oppressed by the devil. Amen? And you and I have got to realize that, that there are demonic forces moving behind the scenes all the time. And we've got to be a, an understanding people that we can love people, but yet understand that the, the motive a lot of times is demonic of why things are happening the way they are. And we've got to understand that it's hard to swim upstream, and it's easy to flow downstream. We've got to understand that our power and our strength is not in ourselves. It's in Jesus and him dying on the cross. He won the victory for us, praise God. Amen? He won the victory for us. And I believe with all my heart, God has allowed us to experience victory. All right? So every hero in the Bible had to fight the invisible war. Now, the fortunate thing for us, listen to this, everybody. Peru, everybody, listen. The fortunate thing for us is we can look at the Bible and see who the enemy really is. Esther did not have the advantage of being able to understand that Satan was moving the pieces of the puzzle. She thought Haman was the enemy. Now, Haman was being used by the devil, but here's the deal. The Bible is clearly, clearly stating from Genesis to Revelation that it is Satan, Lucifer, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Amen? Amen? So there is a spiritual war going on around us, and we've got to understand how to win in that war. And whenever I think about winning in that war, I think about three specific areas that we've got to win in, all right? Three. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We've got to defeat those three. What is the world? The world is the fallen system that's around us. Okay, 
that there is a demonic force in the world moving against the plan of God all the time. And we've got to resist that world view. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Let's talk about one little bit more home. The flesh. This is you. This is the fallen part of you. In other words, this is the way I like to put it. Some people don't need the devil. They got themselves. They don't need the devil. The devil's over there sitting in a rocking chair. Amen in everything they say about themselves. I'm such a dirtbag. I'm such a worm. I'm such a failure. I'm such a this. I'll never have anything. I'll never have no money. I'm never going to be what God's called me to be. I'm just never, 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 never. It's never going to work out. Never going this. Never going that. Never going this. Never that. And the devil's over there going, Phew, eat them up. He don't even have to do anything. You have empowered the enemy over your life by your own confession, by your own speaking. The devil doesn't have to do anything. He just lets you tear yourself up. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. you got to learn how to defeat the flesh. How do you do it? Renew your mind with the word of God. Only say what the Bible says about you to you. Amen? Here's the third one, the devil. Obviously, we understand that we do not battle against flesh and blood, but there's a real demonic power called Satan, and his demon and demonic activity is moving around us. But we are not subject to it. We are actually empowered to rule over it, praise God. I said, we are called to rule over it, praise God. Yes, we are. Amen? I'm not a victim in Satan's world. Satan is a victim to God's world. Jesus came and defeated him. I'm here to implement the victory that Jesus paid for 2,000 years ago, praise God. And I'm going to see it come to pass. And whether I do it in my lifetime or whether I do it in a resurrected body after the resurrection, it doesn't matter to me. The devil is defeated, praise God. I'm not running around here depressed. I'm not running around here defeated. Amen? Make the devil take a Prozac, praise God. I'm not doing any of that. Amen? Here's the third thing I get out of it. You ready? Private devotion always leads to public responsibility. Private devotion always leads to public responsibility. Esther had a private devotion to God. But listen to this. There came a point in time in her life where that private devotion led to a public responsibility. She wanted to live her faith all in herself. She wanted to, quote, be a closet Christian, which there is no such thing. There is always a point in which your faith encounters the world. There is a point in which your personal, private relationship with God encounters a fallen world. And you have to know that that's going to happen. And you have to be ready for it. Esther lived her life all introverted. Then she came to a point where the, her nation of people were going to be wiped out. And she had to step out of herself and into the destiny that God had for her because her private devotion wasn't going to save her. It had to be a public response. I will tell you this as a pastor. I do not take up fights and causes that are not church-related or God-related. I fight for two things. I fight for the kingdom of God and for the people of God. And that's it. I don't get entangled in all the messes. I don't get entangled in all that. But I promise you this. If the church is attacked, if the people of God are attacked, I'm going to fight like crazy. Because that's what shepherds do. That's what pastors do, praise God. Amen? And all I'm trying to say is this. All I'm trying to say is that if you are simply a believer who says, I just want to live my spiritual walk with God. Me and God have our own thing. And I never want to make a public declaration. You are going to sell yourself short of what God wants to do in your life. Because there always is a point where your personal faith becomes a proclamation to everybody around you. It does. And the sooner you do it, the better and safer you are, praise God. Because that's exactly what we had whenever it came to uh, Esther's relationship with God. Here's the fourth thing I get out of Esther's relationship with God. Here it is. Influence and position are for God's kingdom and purpose. Influence and position are for God's kingdom and God's purpose. For God's kingdom and God's purpose. Remember when in the story, Esther, she was put into this place. And her and Mordecai have this conversation. And Mordecai goes, hey, listen. Don't think just because you live in that palace. Don't think just because you got servants. Don't think just because you got that house. Don't think just because you got that car. Don't think just because you got that money. Don't think just because you got that job. Don't think that you, you got all that over there, Esther, that you're going to be unaffected if they go wiping out the Jews. Don't think that. 
See, God puts you in a place of influence. God puts you in a place of purpose for his kingdom and for his glory, not for your comfort, not for your glory. He puts you there for a purpose. See, here's what we have to realize. Our influence, our influence, our positions are really to be used for God's kingdom and for God's glory. I've met people who have great positions and great influence, and yet they'll say, Pastor Charlie, I don't know my purpose. You don't know your purpose because you haven't understood that your influence and position are connected to a kingdom called the kingdom of God. As soon as you realize that your influence and position were given to you for such a time as this, so that you could be in a position to influence people for the kingdom of God. Say, but Pastor Charlie, I'm a doctor. Great. You're a representation of the kingdom of God in the medical field. And you are the healing hands of Jesus. Yes. Pastor Charlie, I'm an attorney. Well, I'm praying for you. <laughs> but you're an attorney in the, in the law field to represent God's kingdom and God's agenda in people's lives. And to stand up for justice and mercy. You say, Pastor Charlie, I, I work in fast food. Really? Then you're a servant of God. Serving people and representing the kingdom of God in that place. Yes, you are. No matter what you do, what sphere of influence you have. It's been given to you for kingdom gain and kingdom glory. Not for your own. Not for your own. And I'm not saying that you can't be blessed. Matter of fact, I'll get there here in a minute. Here's what I'm trying to tell you Esther needed to understand. It's not about you, Esther. It's about something bigger than you. Listen, this platform that I stand on as Pastor Charlie or whatever, all right? Listen, I recognize that it's not about me. It's bigger than me. It's way bigger than me. I'm just the voice. I'm just the one up here trying to tell people about Jesus and to keep them out of going to hell and to try and get them to heaven. I'm just that voice. But it's not about me. It's way bigger than me. Matter of fact, don't even put your eyes on me. Put your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Listen to this. God never limits himself to just one person. He never does. If Esther wouldn't have stood up, God would have delivered the Jews anyway. Now, God was willing to use Esther, and he did end up using Esther because Esther was willing and obedient to not worry about her influence and her position over God's call. Amen? It's a powerful thing. See, here's the truth. You ready? You're blessed to be a blessing. See, I'm blessed to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing. That's my desire. I came up with this definition. I seen this the other day, and I thought it was good. Blessing is enjoying, experiencing, and extending God's goodness. Now, now I want you to hear that. Blessing is enjoying. Is there anything wrong with Esther living in the palace, enjoying it? Okay, some of you women need to say amen to that. Come on. Someone, a year preparation. <laughs> How do you think that went as queen? <laughs> you, know why, you know why the king didn't call her for 30 days, right? It was like it took you a year the first time. <laughs> okay, I, I need to stop, don't I? <laughs> but here's the truth. Is there anything wrong with enjoying the blessing of God? Absolutely not. God wants you to enjoy life. God wants you to enjoy the blessing of God. I enjoy the blessing of God on my life. Pastor Charlie, you're just one of them happy preachers. I am not a depressed preacher. You're just one of them prosperity, God wants to bless you preachers. Yeah, I'm not a curse me preacher. We put it on a sign. It's called abundant life. That's what I believe. I did it as a warning sign to let you know what I believe. <laughs> How about this? Experiencing. So watch this. Enjoying and experiencing. God wants you to experience his goodness and his grace. Now watch the next part. Don't forget this one. This is the part Esther had to get. And extending. Esther, God didn't put you in the palace just to save you. God didn't put you there just for your benefit. God put you there for everyone's benefit. Listen, God wants to bless you so he can bless everybody around you. Amen? It's not just about you. Some of you parents or grandparents, you know, God's blessed you. And you're like, why am I so blessed? Listen, you're blessed to be a blessing. You're blessed not to just soak it up all in yourself. You're blessed to be able to bless others, praise God. I get more enjoyment out of blessing everybody else. Than I, I get more fulfillment out of seeing other people blessed than I do getting blessed myself. 
I do. When somebody gets blessed, I get excited. I'm like, my goodness, that's good. Praise God. I'm so excited. Why? Because, man, that means God's still blessing folks. See, I was thinking about it like this. Check this out. I'll tell you my role, my role. Last week we were in Destin. Down in Destin, they got all these shops, all right? And as you go down these shops, down the Highway 98 down there, you got all these shops on, on both sides. And they got these mannequins standing out there with like these floaties on them and these bathing suits and all this stuff. But you know what mannequins are. They're dummies. They're just dummies, right? Okay, now, now watch. Watch. The purpose of the dummies are to attract attention. Some of you already know where I'm going. <laughs> the purpose of the dummies are to attract attention to get people to come inside. The interaction is not out on the sidewalk. There's no cash registers on the sidewalk. The cash registers are inside. The dummies are out there to draw attention. To say, hey, come on over here and check out what's inside. Guess who the dummy is? <laughs> Pastor Charlie. Pastor Charlie's here. Hey, don't get caught up in me. Look inside the kingdom. Look inside to see. Last week, Josh was the dummy. I take much delight in saying that. But he was saying, hey, look inside. Look inside. Look inside. It's not about us. Don't get your eyes on us. Follow us as we follow Christ, like Paul said. But the reality is, it's not about us. It's about the kingdom. It's about God's purpose. It's about the fulfillment of God in your life. It's about what God wants to do in your life. Amen? Not what you want to do, praise God. Amen? And then, listen, what the dummies are blessed. The dummies outside, they had, they had bathing suits on and they had floaties. But it's only to draw attention so you'll come inside. Can I get a witness? That's a great analogy. I don't care what nobody says. I liked it, all right? I really liked it. Here's the last one. Write this one down. Heroes are always willing to take faith, uh, take faith risk. You know, Esther, if she'd have went before the king and he not summons her, she could have been beheaded. And there would have been nothing that no one would have said about it. She would have been done. All right? I love the, the portion of scripture at the very end right here at this last statement. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, help me out. I perish. She goes, if I go before the king and he kills me, he kills me. But you know what? I'm going to use my influence and my position to do what God has called me to do. And if I perish, I perish. You know, that was a huge faith risk. That was huge. That was huge. She could have been killed. Think about it like this, and this is the way I like to look at it. Listen to this, everybody. Faith is taking a step without a guaranteed outcome. Isn't that what that is? She took a step. She didn't know the outcome. Now, God knew the outcome. She didn't. She just took that step. And when she took that step, can I tell you, God showed up right in the midst of it. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here they are. Throw us in the fire. We will not burn. And then one of them said, if we do, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but we're not going to. But if we do, <laughs> oops. <laughs> All right, we still are going to bow. And that was a faith step. But God showed right up in the midst of their faith step. And I'm here to tell you, if you're going to continue to grow with God, and you're going to go from zero to hero, you're always going to be challenged with faith steps. It's always. And you're going to think that it might kill you to take that step. I mean, I remember when lifting my hands in a worship service I thought was going to kill me. I remember starting to give to God financially. I thought we're going to die and starve. I remember coming to church, I mean, every step along the way. Now, praise God, those steps have, have gotten increasingly bigger. And I've been able to trust God with more and more and more. But it always starts with that first step. And that's why we don't compare ourselves among ourselves. In other words, my step may be a little bit different than your step. But nevertheless, we all get there the same way by taking faith steps. Taking faith steps. Amen? So whenever you look at it, let me ask you a question. What's your faith step? What's the next step you need to take? Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe your first step is accepting Christ. Maybe you need to take a faith step and, and, and start praying or reading the Bible or come to my Develop Your Faith class. 
Maybe your next faith step is to say, you know what, maybe you're watching online or at Peru and you're here for the very first time. You're like, I need to come back to church. Well, praise God. Maybe your first faith step, I need to buy a Bible. We'll give you a Bible, by the way. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible, praise God. I mean, well, what is your next faith step? Because I promise you this, God is challenging each and every one of us to take our next, next faith step. So when you combine it all and you look at it from a thousand mile an hour view, here's what I found in the book of Esther that I believe is powerful, all right? Number one, she understood preparation. Listen, everybody, we're all being prepared for something. And listen, don't be upset in the time of preparation. You may think you're ready, but guess what? God will determine that. And when it happens, man, it'll happen. How about this second part, spiritual warfare? If you find resistance, don't be upset. Don't be upset. There's resistance to everything you want to do for the kingdom of God. The devil is not going to just back up and let you do what you want to do. Not going to happen. Private devotion. It starts with a private devotion, but it will become a public declaration eventually. But you got to stay privately devoted to God. Last part is influence and position are used for kingdom glory and kingdom gain, not for personal gratification. There's nothing wrong with you being blessed as long as you understand that your blessing is connected to blessing others. It's not about you. It's much bigger than you. Last part is faith steps. You got to take faith steps. She had to take a faith step. Moved her from a zero to a hero. What would have happened had she never taken that next step of faith? Have you ever thought about it like that? Think about it like this. She would have been killed. Her family would have been annihilated. The Jews would have been wiped out. There would have been no savior. The world would have been lost in their sin. And can I tell you, we would have no hope of heaven. We'd have no hope of everything. All because one young lady decided to take a step of faith and put herself at risk. I'm here to tell you, that's how you become a hero in the Bible. That's how you become a hero in the eyes of God, taking that next faith step. So what is your next step? I don't know what it is. You're gonna have to pray and ask God. And I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and he will tell you what that next faith step is. Now, if it's accepting Christ, you've never accepted and you'd like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer. I want everybody, Peru, all those online, pray this prayer with me. Or we're all gonna pray together, all right? So join me right now and say this. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe with all my heart you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. So therefore, I put my faith I put my trust in you, in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen. amen. Give the Lord a big, big clap. Praise God.